I would like to talk about incentive leakage in the context of a company or a corporation because this is a really interesting application of the principal agent problem where the principal agent problem is actually a little bit more of a societal solution. So first, let me explain how this works. And we have to start with the principal agent problem, which is basically um, a principal and an agent are any time that one person or one group is trying to get another person to act out the values and the will and the desires of the principal. So the principal is the higher up version generally, and the agent is the lower down version. And classic example here is a manager and a worker where the manager is trying to use financial incentives and social incentives and uh, upward mobility within the company, like the prospects of upward mobility to incentivize the worker to act in a way that's in the company's best interest. And But of course, the worker has their own incentives. They care not only about money, not only about upward mobility, but also about impressing their coworkers, um, about not putting forth too much effort because they want some energy left uh, to spend time with their family in the evening time. They don't want to just completely burn out. They have incentives for, um, you know, hopes that they might eventually move to another company and work their way up by sort of moving between companies. They have all of their own motives. And the motives that the manager can place on that worker are not going to be perfect when it comes to getting the worker to act out the manager's will. So that's the principal agent problem, and the problem is basically just that it's hard to get the agent's incentives aligned with what the principal wants. Those are always imperfect. Now, the basic idea with incentive leakage is that the shareholders want as much money as they can get for their retirement, because these shareholders worked hard for their money, they're saving up for retirement, and if the workers end up enacting their will and sort of uh, doing what they want instead of serving the interest of the shareholders, uh, th the shareholders will not be happy. But the basic idea here is that every single step from the shareholders to the board of directors to the CEOs to the high up managers to the low down managers, all the way down to the workers, every single pairing there is a principal and agent pairing. And there's always going to be leakage, in other words, some um, incentives between any given pair that are not perfectly aligned. So the farther you get away from the initial principle, the more leakage there will be in structuring incentives. That's the basic idea. So let's just go through these one by one to think a little bit about how the incentives may not align between these two actors. So the shareholders just care about the return on their money. That's all they care about. They elect a board of directors whose job it is to hold the CEO accountable to making money for the shareholders. Now, the board of directors may care about networking opportunities in the board of directors. They may care about um, their political stance within this industry. They may care about um, making more money or the prospect of getting other uh, positions on other board of directors. And some of those things are sort of wheeling and dealing between this board of directors class that might lead to a situation where they would not necessarily act in the best interest of the shareholders. Like they may agree to something just because it would be uh, strategically and politically unsavvy to disagree with the other board of director member who uh, has a lot of power and could get your wife a position at a school she wants or a university she wants. Or the fact that there is a politic between these board of directors, that's one misaligned incentive. So here we have an imperfect alignment between the incentives of the shareholders and the board of directors. Now, of course, the board of directors and CEOs, they have um, similar misalignments going on. Let's just pretend for a moment that the board of directors is really, truly just um, perfectly enacting the shareholders' will and just trying to make sure the CEO is maximizing profit. Well, the CEO cares about their own status. There's sort of a status game competition between CEOs. They want to beat that other player uh, during their tenure as the CEO. And that means if 
um, doing the thing that's good for the CEO's career in the short run might be bad for the company in the long run, the CEO might try to do that. And the board of directors has a few means to hold the CEO accountable. Like they can look at the books and they can make their own judgment and say, wait a second, investment in this project is probably a waste of money in the long run. It just sort of gets you more accolades for your personal self right now. And they can have that conversation, they, they can hold over the CEO the threat of ousting them. They have some tools for incentivizing the CEO to align with the shareholders. But those tools are not going to be perfect. There's going to be some leakage there. Now we could go all the way down the, the line between the CEO and the high managers, the high managers and the middle managers, and do the same exercise, of course. And we've already talked about the middle manager versus the, the workers. There, there's definitely misalignments and incentives there. Now, um, economists can model every single one of these principal agent problems by modeling what are the incentives of the high manager, what is the complete list of things that motivate them? What are the tools the CEO has for incentivizing? How well do those tools work? And that's essentially what economists do when we, when we go through principal agent problems. We ask ourselves, what's the tool set for incentivizing? What's the um, incentives that this the agent cares about? And how much leakage is there? And one way of thinking about this is you could actually look at this high manager and list the things they care about and how well aligned those things can be with the, the tool set the CEO has to, uh, has to offer. So actually, first let me list the tool set the CEO can use to influence the high manager because it's basically the same set of tools at each level of this um, hierarchy, of this structure. So the tool set for any given CEO or manager is going to be these broad classes of financial incentives. And that financial incentives can include commission, pay rate, um, all uh, bonuses, obviously. Lots of financial incentives are possible. There's a whole category of incentives underneath this one. And then social incentives, I mean, that's why we have so many meetings at work, is that the meetings align people's attention and align their motives and make people uh, care about what their peers are doing. That attention from peers incentive happens in these meetings where the managers can align incentives. So social incentives, I think upward mobility incentives are overlooked sometimes, but sometimes the most powerful types of incentives, which are who gets to move up within the company to gain more status and money and respect. And it's going to be the people who are doing the best job of um, achieving the manager's uh, goals as they set forth in meetings. So this is just a tool set for motivating the person just below them. Now let's look at a bunch of uh, incentives at play or a bunch of things that motivate, say, a middle manager in response to this and see how well these align. So just a few of the incentives we might consider are um, they're motiv motivated to impress their coworkers or maybe a particular coworker, maybe their boss. They're motivated by money, by avoiding effort so that their effort can go toward things on the weekend and toward their family. They might be motivated toward avoiding conflict and toward status seeking. So this is just a beginning of a list. But one way of thinking about this is we could sort of put a percentage onto each of these in terms of how well aligned is that motive with the incentives that are set up by the principal who's designing their incentive structure. And we might imagine impressing coworkers. This could be a positive incentive, especially if the manager, uh, the, the principal does a great job of motivating people at meetings. But if they have a devious coworker who is, uh, who's sort of impressed by sticking it to the boss, that could actually have a negative alignment of incentives with the principal's goals. So I'll just put 10% on this one. Money tends to be more aligned with the tool set here, so we'll say 50% incentive. But a lot of people have jobs where they don't get that much more money from putting forth more effort, so I don't want to make it 
Avoiding effort, of course, is going to be negatively correlated with the tool set that we're trying to use to motivate them. So I'll put that one at negative 50%. Avoiding conflict, especially if this is a manager, that could be, say, negative 40% in terms of how, uh, how much it aligns with the principal's goals. And then status may be somewhat well aligned because status has to do with upward mobility within the company. So maybe this is, say, 30% aligned. Now, I just came up with those numbers. Um, if you were doing a real analysis, you would come up with uh, more robust numbers in each category. But you can see that a lot of these incentives don't align. So as you go down the chain of each new pair of principal ag agent sort of relationship, you're going to lose a bunch of the incentives so that they're not perfectly aligned with the shareholders. Now, one thing I want to add to show you how this might actually be a good thing when it comes to companies is um, we might add in motivators down here ethics. So each person along this hierarchy has their own sense of ethical values, their own sense of what they will and will not do at a company. And even if something were to be um, really good for the shareholders but basically unethical, maybe the board of directors would stop that because that uh, that doesn't jive with their sense of ethics. And then even if the board of directors is, is sort of perfectly aligned with shareholders, as you move down this chain of command, down to the very bottom workers, um, someone may catch the ethical mistake along the way. That may be a huge motivator for them. And maybe even if they can't completely say no, they could quit. That could lead to higher turnover. Higher turnover would be something that um, would need to be considered even from a, the perspective of shareholders. So because of this incentive leakage, you can get a watering down of some of the problems where companies are motivated to do things that are uh, bad for the world or unethical. So I just thought that was really cool that the principal agent problem is sometimes the, the opposite of a problem. Sometimes it's a solution rather than something to be worried about. And this is a case where I think that's true.